Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. We want to welcome and thank you guys for joining today's webinar, Data Security and Privacy Paving the Way for Industry Leaders. In today's presentation, I'll introduce and welcome our host, Rick Kelly, Senior Vice President of Products and Research, Brandon Lee, Solutions Consultant, and Mary Sarbulescu, Vice President of R&D. Our agenda for today will include how customer security is becoming the most desired brand attribute, customer data and privacy, what it really means functionally, creating an ecosystem of customer privacy. My name is Lisa Lopez. I'm the content specialist here at Bill Cycle, and I'm very excited to have you with us today. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping items. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If you have any questions at any time throughout today's presentation, feel free to submit them to either the question or chat box inside the GoToWebinar interface. We will catalog them throughout the presentation and come back to them at the end of the presentation. Also, I wanted to mention, if you haven't joined us before, we will have a substantial catalog of case studies, quite diverse webinars, and industry resources located at fuelcycle.com under the resources section, which I encourage you to take a look at when you have time. Today's webinar should take about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll go into a 10-minute Q&A session. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Rick Kelly, who will be speaking first, has spent most of his career in the market research industry, working closely with clients and operations teams to ensure client needs are met. He has published articles on market research methods and delivered presentations at the MRA, PAPOR, and AAPOR, among others. His research interests center around using new technology to capture data. Brandon Lee is our solutions consultant at Fuel Cycle, helping to consult brands and enterprise market research teams on the needs and challenges they face by creating solutions with the capabilities of the Fuel Cycle Market Research Cloud. And it's generated ecosystem of the best in-class insights tools. Brandon has a background in implementation and account management services at several SaaS companies and has earned a BA in economics accounting from UCSD. Um, and then with 16 years of experience in the software development industry, Marin is the VP of Research and Development at FuelCycle, responsible for de developing FuelCycle's applications and technology infrastructure. Since early 2012, he has helped transform the FuelCycle stack and build a solid and scalable tech organization. So without further introduction, I will hand this over to Rick to get us started. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you to the uh, dozens of people who have, have taken time out of their day to, to join us. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, talking with you today and hope to hear some feedback from you after we're done. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about customer security, which is typically regarded as a, uh, you know, maybe a, a more boring uh, webinar topic. But uh, given it's important to uh, our, our future, I think it's, a, it's an important topic for us to discuss today. Um, you know, really, um, you know, in the customer insights and market research and customer experience space, uh, a lot of what we do is predicated on collecting and managing uh, data. Uh, much of it can be sensitive data. And so, you know, as we see a, a real need from consumer populations demanding uh, that they are able to have better control and, and manage data along with like new legal requirements, it's important that uh, our industry lead the way in providing security uh, functionality and privacy practices that uh, meet uh, growing consumer needs. Um, so today, uh, I'm gonna kind of walk through a, a few, kind of the legal landscape, also is the, um, you know, kind of the personal landscape of, of, you know, consumer perceptions as well. So uh, earlier this year, there was a lot of hand-wringing uh, around, around a new law that was going into effect in the European Union called a GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. So passed a couple of years ago, uh, came into effect in, in May of this year. Um, GDPR gave expansive, or, you know, uh, gave expansive rights to consumers around how they manage their personally identifiable information, which we will refer to typically as PII. So PII is uh, any data that can be used to identify an individual. So it can go, it can be first name, you know, last name, uh, it can be a street address, it can even be an IP address. And so GDPR now places a lot of requirements on organizations to protect and manage personal, uh, personal data in a responsible way. 
And uh, also like the, the legal requirements uh, allows consumers to, to manage their data so that they can delete it uh, as you know, from a website that they've already provided it to. Um, they have to have explicit opt-in and have uh, e explained to them how their data is going to be used and for what purposes. And you also have to give consumers the option to, uh, you know, port their data from one source to another. So a way to request request data and then to uh, share it with, uh, uh, you know, in a machine readable format. And the so this obviously affected just about every. A uh, company with a digital footprint, which at this point is is nearly uh, everyone, and uh, the the ramifications for violating uh, GDPR are you know, particularly onerous. So uh, you can face you know face uh, fines of, of 20, 20 million euros or more uh, based on the volume of, of data that uh, is shared and the extent of the leak and the uh, you know any issues that you might have by exposing uh, personally identifiable personally identifiable information. Okay, so GDPR came into effect. It's it's had you know uh, you know it's had a pretty significant effect on uh, American companies as well as you know anybody who's doing business overseas uh, you know needs to comply with GDPR. Um, but you know to, to be honest, like it's not just a European issue. Um, it's also an American issue, uh, and by American, of course, we mean uh, Americans. But I'm also referring to other non-EU uh, nations because privacy is a universal thing. And uh, you know, we've seen a lot of data, you know, uh, over 90% of American consumers are very concerned with the way that companies collect and manage uh, their personal data. So aside from consumer perceptions, which are obviously very important to keeping and maintaining uh, you know, uh, customer relationships, uh, there are new there's new legislation in California uh, that essentially uh, mimics the uh, mimics GDPR uh, that comes into effect in 2020, and that's called the California California Consumer Privacy Law. And so, the same requirements that I spoke about a moment ago around uh, protecting and managing uh, and and uh, you know protecting and managing personal data uh, for Europeans uh, will will affect uh, Californians as well. And because uh, you know most companies don't really uh, operate within you know, specific borders in the U.S. Uh, essentially what's going to happen is uh, California just kind of threw a stake in the ground and now every U.S. company with a digital footprint is going to have to provide the same level of functionality uh, that those companies operating in the EU do uh, as well. And so uh, not just the consumer perception, the consumer need for uh, personal data management, but now there's going to be a legal requirement behind that as well. And uh, so if, if we can move to the next slide, you know, really one of the things that we can also think about is that in addition to the legal ramifications uh, of managing, you know, of, of bad management of personal data, along with the consumer desire for uh, good personal data management, there's a large and significant cost uh, to data breaches and issues with personal data management. And obviously, uh, these go beyond. This is beyond like the, the legal fines that can occur, and this comes you know, direct from the uh, the fallout. So millions of dollars are lost uh, each year uh, in personal data breaches, and they do happen in, in every industry. Uh, we've seen several in the past uh, past three or four years, uh, from large retailers uh, to uh, social media companies and so on. And uh, they're becoming more and more expensive and more and more expansive as uh, as every company becomes a, a digital uh, company as well. So what to do? So number one thing is that brands absolutely need to be the stewards of privacy and security um, in order to maintain consumer trust going forward. And this especially applies to organizations that want to use uh, customer data to make better business decisions. As more and more products uh, or services become digital, uh, security and privacy become absolute requirements uh, to operating, and especially given the space that uh, you know fuel cycle and you know uh, and many of our clients operate in, where you know you want to collect and manage personal data, it's important to uh, be transparent with consumers how you use it, and to provide a set of controls 
that uh, you know enable you to be successful. And so at this point, I'm going ahead and transfer the, the balance of the presentation over to my colleagues at Brandon and Marin to walk through how we actually do this and what does this mean on a functional basis. Okay, great. Thanks, Rick. Uh, hey, everyone. This is Brandon Lee. I work over here at Fuel Cycle as a solutions consultant. And what I'm going to be covering today is just uh, the general idea of uh, customer data and privacy and what this means functionally within the Fuel Cycle platform. And so if we can uh, transition over to the next slide, um, we want to think of uh, GDPR compliance as uh, something like purchasing life or property or uh, auto insurance. So it's, of course, something that doesn't really provide much uh, near-term value, um, but it definitely does um, provide protect, uh, protection in the face of long-term risk. And so, um, you know, I think we all know that life and business can be unpredictable. And um, it's really, of course, difficult to foresee when uh, difficult or unfortunate events may occur. And so uh, compliance and things like GDPR are really taking the necessary steps to mitigate risk and it's never something that you want to consider in hindsight, like, oh, I really wish that we had these measures or controls in place to have prevented something like this from happening. And so um, with GDPR compliance, we're really ensuring that data is handled with much greater responsibility and sensitivity. And these sorts of measures are really what uh, is going to reduce the overall risk of uh, something um, really uh, great or uh, catastrophic, like a data breach or a leak. And so when um, you're considering working with, you know, different partners or platforms, um, you really want those that are championing the, uh, the mitigation of this sort of risk. And we really believe here at Fuel Cycle that GDPR compliance is certainly a step in the right direction. And so uh, moving on over into um, uh, Article 4 of uh, GDPR compliance, um, there are two definitions of uh, entities. So there are data controllers and data processors. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, clients and brands that may use the fuel cycle platform, data controllers are you, a client, who will essentially dictate the purpose of uh, and means of collecting personal data. So in the context of a uh, research platform like Fuel Cycle, um, as an enterprise or brand, you're using our platform to gather insights and to inform uh, better uh, business decisions and support business objectives. So, um, and then data controllers in turn will then use a data processor, like a software platform like Fuel Cycle, and uh, this is the means through which personal data is being processed and collected. So um, beyond, you know, the um, organizational controls uh, that may exist in, uh, within your organization, uh, the data controller, a data processor like Fuel Cycle should definitely have the necessary mechanisms in place to ensure that data is protected and the privacy of its users and respondents are uh, protected with, um, uh, without any concern. And so uh, in terms of how Fuel Cycle supports GDPR compliance, um, there uh, on the screen, you should see a list of different um, uh, things that we've put into place. And so um, we should um, not only see these measures as something that um, ensures compliance with GDPR, but to Rick's point that he mentioned earlier, um, you know, these, these sorts of measures uh, not only apply to companies that are collecting data uh, across these uh, over in the European Union, but these measures also um, definitely reinforce our platform's ability to ensure the utmost data protection and privacy of our users. And so to the different market research teams that we may be speaking with today, uh, we understand that you know, there's a pretty rigorous and uh, thorough process when it comes to uh, the uh, security of, of any sort of software or solution you may be using uh, to do your market research. And so when we uh, have these sorts of mechanisms in place, again, they, don't not, they not only uh, meet the needs of GDPR compliance, but they ensure that uh, any US-based company is um, handling data in a very responsible way. And so we can, uh, you know, with Fuel Cycle as an instance, uh, we work with uh, many of the top brands across um, a variety of different industries. And we understand that industries like um, insurance or financial services have especially um, uh, rigorous requirements. And so, you know, we as a platform can definitely attest uh, to these 
uh, sorts of requirements. And so uh, just as a general quick overview um, in terms of our platform, uh, we ensure that um, we always get explicit user consent. And so this appears in the form of an automatic pop-up. And so whenever any sort of US or EU based user is um, interacting with our platform, we're informing them in uh, common terms and language uh, of how their data is going to be used. Um, another aspect of GDPR compliance is that user data can be exported um, in an easy way. And so we can uh, always uh, export profile data or any sort of survey responses or comments or attachments that are uploaded to the community. Um, GDPR also uh, dictates that the users or members can request the uh, uh, erasure of their uh, data from the platform. And so uh, we make this an easy process. We're not going to have a user you know, jump through a bunch of different hoops. Uh, they can make this request and then from there it's honored uh, through our platform. Um, our platform also um, institutes uh, least privileged access to PII. So we can uh, essentially limit access to different users throughout our platform and essentially dictate who has access to what. And um, not only that, but uh, um, different fields of uh, profile data, such as uh, email address or IP addresses, names, usernames, street addresses that may be collected through our platform are automatically designated as PII. So there are controls behind that. And then last but not least, um, we make the terms of use and the private, privacy policies throughout our platform easy to understand. And so our platform supports uh, sample templates for these policies, and um, you know these are uh, we encourage our users to to make a thorough review of this uh, documentation and essentially um, fine tune it for their own organization. Uh, so those are the ways in which um, Fuel Cycle supports GDPR compliance throughout our platform. And again, this not only applies to companies that uh, may operate in the EU, but also uh, applies broadly to the uh, to the companies that operate in the U.S. and um, is definitely um, something that's a step in the right direction for um, those upcoming regulations, like uh, those that are going to be instituted in California in the near future. Uh, so yeah, uh, with uh, that being said, I think I'll hand things over to uh, Marin to go through uh, his slides here. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, my name is Marin Sardulescu. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Research and Development here at Fuel Cycle, and I'm going to cover the technical side of the GDPR implementation. Uh, as you might know, at Fuel Cycle, uh, data is our bread and butter. Uh, you know, we're a data first application. So uh, we need to have multiple layers of data protection and anonymization. Um, some of the things that uh, we do here, uh, one of the most important is uh, data encryption. Uh, all our data is encrypted uh, in transit at address. Um, we also restrict, uh, aggressively restrict the access to the data uh, based on the principle of least privilege. And we also, you know, intensively monitor uh, the access to, uh, to any bit of data that we have. Um, we perform daily code and data structure reviews. Our director of engineering manually uh, comes through each line of code, ensuring it respects uh, OWASP 10. Uh, we also do, uh, we run quarterly application security tests. We have static code analysis uh, and manual penetration testing. Um, the tests are run by specialized third parties and only any vulnerabilities that we might find are addressed on the spot. And least but, um, last but not least, we offer full PI customization. Um, now let's just uh, dive a little bit deeper into each of these points. When it comes to data encryption, uh, our data is encrypted using uh, AES-256 in transit address. Um, in transit means that regardless what the user does on the website, uh, maybe submitting a form, or loading a page, or making a comment, data being sent between the website and the user's computer will be encrypted. Um, data encryption address means that the stored data can only be read by the application and not by any other means. Um, you know, just a little bit of background, um, the entire full cycle stack is hosted on AWS. And for our database solution, we use uh, AWS MySQL version called RDS. Um, when it comes to application security, um, 
you know, data encryption doesn't mean much without a secure application. So uh, you have attackers that can potentially use many different paths to your application to harm your business and organization. And, you know, each of these paths uh, represents a risk that may or may not be serious enough to warrant your attention, you know, and uh, the effort that you're, you know, you're available to, to put into this. Um, on our side of things at FuelCycle, uh, the engineers perform daily code and data structure reviews to ensure that the backend infrastructure avoids OWASP top 10 most critical security risks. Uh, for those of you that uh, never heard of OWASP, um, it's an open web application security project and it focuses on identifying the most serious web application security risks for a broad array of organizations. Um, some of those risks are uh, cross-site scripting, injection, uh, sensitive data exposure, or broken authentication. Um, the next thing would be the security testing. So, uh, you know, I love my team of engineers. Uh, I know they're great, but we also love independent third-party reviews. Uh, I think there's the same trust by verify. So, um, you know, um, fuel cycle photo application security test is performed on a quarterly basis, like I mentioned before and we're using industry-leading security providers like HP or Veracode. Um, our main two tests are the static code analysis and the manual penetration test. Uh, the static code analysis checks every line of code in a non-runtime environment for poor coding practices or other flaws that are, you know, uh, usually they, they, they sit through. Um, the manual pen test is what I would call the daddy of all tests um, because you have human beings, you know, behind the keyboard testing both the public and the private section of your application. Um, if any vulnerabilities are found, uh, they are addressed immediately uh, based on their criticality. Uh, for example, if you have, uh, you know, you have five levels of criticality, the most critical would be addressed in one business day, uh, the high, you know, it's gonna be two days, so on. Um, and then on the PI customization, uh, this is pretty interesting actually because most platforms come, you know, uh, they have a default uh, PI designation. So you're going to have a bunch of uh, user profile fields, you know, like full name, email address, um, and they will be classified as PI by default, uh, you know, and basically just to, to meet the minimum requirements for GDPR compliance. Uh, in contrast to that, FuelCycle allows users to flag any profile field as PII. So, for example, if you have a survey question answer, um, you can qualify as PII, and then the system will take care of the rest. Um, basically, the data is going to be masked everywhere, and it's going to be removed from exports and reports. Um, the normal data I.O. Uh, flow is censored, so all the data pipes that you have, uh, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be watching for the, the PII field that you just flagged and remove it. And only select administrators authorized by the client would have access to the PII. Um, and I think that about covers the technical side. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much to Rick, Brandon, and Marin. Um, that was really informative and interesting to hear and learn. Um, so we actually do have a few questions that have come in so far. Uh, the first question comes in from Elizabeth, who wants to know, Aside from following GDPR compliance, what kind of privacy assessment tools has your organization used to ensure you, would, you are adhering to the highest possible standards of data security? And I will hand this over to Rick to respond to you. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Uh, thank you for asking it. I think you know, one of the things that Marin discussed uh, just a moment ago is that we look for certification from uh, independent third parties and, and independent art audits. Uh, so both around like our application security, but also to ensure that we follow the processes that we say that we're going to, to follow. And so for us, um, we obviously, as Marin stated a little bit earlier, you know, we, we want to do a great job, um, but, uh, you know, of, of managing ourselves, but we also believe that uh, it's important to use third party, uh, you know, uh, independent auditors that, uh, you know, will participate or, or analyze our application on their own. All right, awesome. Um, and then we do have another question, and it's about, this one comes in from Marcus, who asks, in an industry like market research where gathering customer data is everything, do you see implementing data security as a disadvantage? 
Um, and how difficult in terms of manpower and cost has it been to create a new processes to be compliant? So I'll let Brandon answer the first part and then Mary answer the second. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, when uh, speaking to my slides, I, I would say that uh, making these sorts of, um, you know, putting these measures into place and uh, making investments into uh, ensuring the uh, utmost data protection and privacy of users is uh, shouldn't be really seen as like a disadvantage. It's really something that, um, again, um, in the long run, mitigates that risk and it really prevents um, something catastrophic from happening, such as a data breach or um, or leak. And so, um, when we institute these sorts of measures, uh, as dictated by uh, GDPR, um, this is really going to um, put these processes in place that really mitigate uh, as much risk as possible. And so, um, you know, you can't really ever go back from um, like a like a breach or or some sort of um, uh, a violation like that and so you know making sure to never reach that point is something that uh, fuel cycle um, believes in and uh, it's something that we institute through our platform and through compliance to, to measures like GDPR so definitely something that's worthwhile for for our companies uh, that we work with to consider and something that we invest heavily in right so the second part of the question that that's very interesting actually um, so whatever whatever effort the company needs to put into becoming GDPR compliant is, I would say, a one-time effort. Because fortunately, most of the policies required by the GDPR compliant can be coded in, which means once the software has been updated, there is not much room for human error. Now, um, regarding how much time and effort the GDPR implementation takes, that mainly, I would say, depends on two factors. Um, the first would be, is your platform only tracking data or storing it as well? Because if you're storing data, then you have to deal with, with backups. Uh, you have to deal with selective replication, uh, long-term storage, uh, data removal, and, and other you know, mystical, magical things like that. Uh, and that, that's a lot of work. Um, the second thing you would need to look at and I think it's even more important is how many distinct data pipes your application has. Because for each data pipe, you would need to, app to apply the GDPR restrictions. So for example, if you just display data on, on the website, it's pretty simple. You just need to you know, censor uh, the data that is being displayed and make sure nothing goes through that it's not supposed to. But if you also export that data uh, or you use it in reports or charts, or make it available by API, or you exchange with third parties, then you're looking at a pretty serious effort. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions we have so far. Um, if anyone is still on the fence about whether to submit their questions, now would be the time. Um, in the meantime, I will send any questions that come in later to our team to answer individually. If you do have any follow-up questions, um, I just want to thank again Rick, Brandon, and Mary for your time. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars and thank you for joining us.